So how do we identify bad SQL given an AWR? Please remember, one of the pitfalls of using AWR is that the AWR gives you only the top SQLs. There could have been other SQLs that got executed and for example an SQL has an SLA of 0 0.05 seconds and it executed within one second but it never featured as part of the top SQL as possible. So keep that in mind when I say SLA this is something you have agreed from an application perspective. So an AWR may not necessarily give you all the SQLs that executed in that snapshot window. So if you are particular about identifying SQLs and looking at them, the best way to look at that is by looking into an ASH report, which is basically active session history report. So I'm going to spend some time to help you understand what is this ASH report as such. If I have to compare it with AWR, AWR has a timeline in which we have different snapshots taken and when you generate an AWR report you basically give a begin snap and an end snap and you are trying to figure out what happened in this time period which is interesting overall. It's like looking at a big picture and seeing what are the top problems. But active session history's objective is entirely different. So first let's understand what is the active session history? V$ session is a view which basically has information about what a session is doing at any given time. It is not just about what a session is doing. It is about all sessions in the database, all connections within the database. Now what you need to notice amongst these sessions, some might be active meaning they are doing something, some might be inactive, which means they are not doing anything. If something is active, then maybe it is executing a SQL. When something is inactive, it's actually idle. That's what it means. This V$ session is a dynamics performance view. Now, what do we mean by a dynamic performance view? as and when you go and query the data inside that V$ session, you get to see whatever it is doing at that point in time. For example, if I query right now, I will know what the database is doing right now. After five seconds, if I query that, it will tell me what is happening at that point in time. So it is as of that moment in time. So let's say at 5 p.m. in the evening, your colleague comes and says, hey, I had a problem at 10 a.m. in the morning for this particular activity which I did in this particular whatever, whatever, whatever. You don't have any means of going to this point in time and seeing what happened. You can only get an AWR report which captures that period. But there is no guarantee that SQL that they could have executed was captured. That is where ASH comes in of help. So what does ASH actually do? There is an in-memory view called as V$ active session history. Now, this is an in-memory view, meaning it is there in memory. And what happens is automatically within the database, every one second, select star from V$ session where status is equal to active is put into this. So you can say active session history has history at one second intervals about what were active sessions doing? It's like saying there is a job that is running in the background which every second runs and says select star from V$ session and insert it into V$ active session history where state is equal to active which means whatever active sessions are doing that data is dumped into this view. And this V$ active session history basically has information about the last 60 minutes in memory view i cannot keep a lot of data what happens beyond 60 minutes it gets written into another view called as dba history active session history 
but it doesn't write everything because if it has to write all this, there's a lot of IO that is going to happen. So it only takes one in 10 seconds. So you can say what you will find in DBA history, active session history is like somebody wrote from V dollar session once in 10 seconds to be dumped in here. Just one question on this one. Yeah. Let's say if I'm using a connection pool and mm -hmm. connection pool is made out of, let's say, 100 uh, uh, connections. And mm -hmm. out of that, uh, let's say 60 connections are active, mm -hmm. and meaning they are doing something, mm -hmm. like firing a SQL and executing something, mm -hmm. or executing a PL SQL block, mm -hmm. but the 40s are not. Mm -hmm. Okay, they are connect, they are connected, but they are not, not doing, doing anything. anything, or they are not, uh, not using that. Correct. Right? Meaning both of them. Right? Yeah. So, will I get those information from uh, the V dollar session? As from, inactive, yes. I'm talking about the 40, not yes. the 60s. Yes. In V dollar session, you will get information about both. Okay. It is only in A, only you will not get information about the inactive guys. If your colleague came to you at 5 p.m. and told they had a problem at 10 a.m., the only question you need to ask is, did that take more than 10 seconds in the database? If it took more than 10 seconds in the database, then you can find it here because this guy has one in 10 seconds an entry here. So which means between two 10 seconds, there will be one entry available and I can pick it up. But if it is less than 10 seconds, you can't get it. But if the person reports to you within one hour, you will be able to pick it up from V dollar active session history because there one second intervals are available. So if the query ran more than one second, you can surely pick it up from here. That's what Ash report or active session history report is all about. And it will tell you about what did the SQL do in terms of how many blocks it read, what it waited for, etc., etc. All that information will come in. That is what active session history is in terms of an AWR and active session history. Both have two different objectives altogether. So now coming back to here, from an AWR, if you have identified SQLs, what do you think is bad SQL? What is bad IO? These are the questions. So first, what is bad SQL? It could be something that took too long to respond or it was waiting for something or it consumes a lot of resources, CPU, IO, memory, all these can be considered bad SQL. Bottom line, if it affects the SLA of whatever you have agreed that the query should run or it is impacting other SQLs because if one query is doing a lot of IO that impacts other queries IO, then it is a bad SQL. So that's what is a basic idea about bad SQL. Is there something called bad IO? Is doing excessive IO bad? Uh, could be, but I wouldn't blame always the SQL for the reason, because if you have set your buffer cache to be small, that can result in a lot of IO. If you have not configured multiple buffer pools, that can result in a lot of IO. So many a times you not configuring can result or not having a particular index, but an SQL per se does not have control on whether it is going to read from disk or read from memory. So that's something we already discussed earlier. So always a SQL should not be judged based on whether it is doing disk reads or buffer gets. Add them both. That is what it is responsible for. More disk reads or more memory reads is not in the hands of the SQL. It is up to you depending on how you configure everything. But if a SQL is doing a lot of disk plus memory reads, then you might want to consider tuning it. Sum of buffer gates plus disk reads is what you need to bother about. Don't consider a SQL bad, whether it is doing more disk reads or not. Now, is there any threshold as to when do I call certain number of buffer gates plus disk reads as bad? Every drop counts. So if you want better throughput, save every millisecond of CPU, every byte of memory, every IO operation. Remember the bowel we started discussing day one, you can't necessarily go about considering to increase the size of your bowel. That's probably not the best way to fix a problem. You, by increasing hardware, you might get the problem again at a later point in time. So that's not always the ideal solution. There's another problem. People ask me, Ram, should I bother about a single query that consumes a lot of resources or if it is multiple executions? Let's take the AWR as an example. So we have this OLTPDB, which was given 
I don't know what is there in it. So let's go and be curious to see what we can find. So let's say I will look at CPU time. So look at this. There is a particular SQL which ran three times, which means in three executions, totally it consumes around 1500 seconds of CPU, which means on an average per execution so much. And this is totally 9% of all the CPU that happened inside this period. On the other hand, there is another SQL which each execution only did around 7.9 seconds. But if you look at cumulatively, it has consumed 1432, which means both this guy and this guy are culprits for consuming CPU. Same way it could be for IO. If I have something on reads, look at this. There is this query that ran two times and consumed 8 million buffer gets. But there's this guy who ran 44 times and consumed 16 million. Both of them you need to consider. So they execute once or they execute a million times. In both the cases, if you can tune the query, you can make them run by consuming lesser resources. You can tune the query in various ways as we have discussed. Look at alternate access paths, look at uh, buffer pools, look at caching, look at flash cache. All of these could be possibilities. But the underlying factor you need to see is, can you make them reduce use resources? Like instead of using 10 buffer gets, can I make it use one? Instead of using two seconds of CPU, can I make it use one? How will a SQL use CPU? It could be because of parse or because of whatever computation it is doing. Look at what a function is doing inside. Many a times I see queries which have a lot of function calls. Remember every function call is going to result in some computation. So you start with the top SQLs in the AWR just like what we did and identify who's the culprit there and then go into that and see what you can do about it. Now, what you should do is not within the scope of this course. As I told you earlier, our idea is to diagnose what is the problem. Fixing it, next course. So that's the way I will put it. So is it a problem with the SQL? There are cases where the SQL itself could be a problem, wherein the way it is written is wrong. Like there's a joint condition missing or there are too many function calls, etc. What is the resource it is using or is it waiting for something? Or is there a concurrency issue in terms of how you have configured your application itself. The same row is requested by 100 different people. Obviously, there will be a concurrency wait. So where can you get information about it? That is where an ASH comes into play. And if you use Enterprise Manager, there are other tools that you can use. But ASH is a good report to start with, even if you don't have Enterprise Manager. So once you have identified your bad SQL, you either go and increase resources or tune. Look at what you can do to tune it. This was one example, consumer group mappings. Remember in one of the AWRs, we had a case where 60% weight was because of resource manager. So look at whether you can give it more resources if it is deprived of resources. If it is the instance that is reduced in terms of amount of CPU, which is also another problem, or try to get more hardware. Otherwise, consider what you can do to tune the query. So that's a different ball game altogether. When it comes to SQL tuning, we are looking at one problem at a time and looking at how do we can fix that. And that becomes application specific. Whereas troubleshooting a database is looking at the big picture and figuring out who is the trouble guy in the whole part and try to isolate or identify what it is. Then let's fix it later. And tuning is a tougher task. Asking for this is easier because you just ask for it and it is given. It's going to cost a lot of money. But if you can spend some time in trying to figure out what you can do to make the SQL run better, there's nothing like it. So that brings us to the end of this chapter. So I told you about AWR and ASH. There is a bunch of references I've given. Here is one document which you can see to see how you can use uh, AWR, though it doesn't give to the level at which I've explained. These are some of the things you can try to use to see how to read the AWR. Then buffer cache related issues, shared pool related issues. These are all uh, support notes from Oracle's uh, MOS or my Oracle support, library cache and other things, bunch of things. So it's nothing specific. These are all things that you can look at to gain more interesting things. Now, this is another interesting thing you might want to look at. So there are webcasts that Oracle support provides and they are archived and made available. You can go through them for further learning.